Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every single episode, I feature a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And I am so pumped to welcome my guest today, Christopher Day. Let me tell you a little about Christopher and his business, Demand Jump, which I think can help me, it can help you, it can help everyone, because basically what he's going to tell us is how he helps companies increase their marketing performance, in some cases double it, which is pretty hard to believe. But Christopher is the co-founder and CEO of Demand Jump, which he started in Indianapolis about three years ago. About 40 employees, they just raised a Series A round of financing, and they're now working with some Fortune 500 companies with what is called artificial intelligence marketing. It's basically a platform that will show marketers where they should focus to drive revenue. And as you can imagine, you know, any kind of artificial intelligence marketing platform is going to tell marketers uh, not just where people are finding them, but where I should proactively go out to find them. And so he's going to walk us through how they do that. But really over the next 20 minutes, we're going to spend time with Christopher talking about how he's built the team, the organization, and so forth. So with all that set up, welcome Christopher. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for making the time. Maybe you could just uh, give us the 60-second backstory of what led you to co-found Demand Jump in the first place. Absolutely. Well, I've, I've been lucky enough to be a, a serial entrepreneur for most of my adult life, except for the first kind of four or five years out of college. And I've always been frustrated with marketing. Always felt like it was kind of a, a black hole that we would spend a lot of money in, in various companies that I was a part of co-founding and, and ultimately exiting. And then uh, during one of those companies, uh, this is about four or five years ago, I met uh, a gentleman named Sean Schwegman that was the CMO for Overstock. And as soon as I met Sean, I knew that I wanted to go pursue a better way to do marketing uh, with him. And so that's the, that's the short story. Sean's background on how he was a part of help growing uh, Overstock to what I like to call catastrophic success. Um, uh, some things that he figured out back then have really never been productized hmm. and largely, largely probably couldn't be productized because we didn't have the computational power, um, finding people to know how to build the math um, until probably, you know, in database structure as well. Those are kind of the three critical things. Those probably weren't even available until maybe the last five years or so. Yeah. So that was kind of, that was kind of how we started at Demand Jump. So before we talk about the, the, the people part of Demand Jump, give us a sense of kind of the, the specific customer value proposition. So I'm the head of marketing of a large company. What does Demand Jump help me do? Yep. So Demand Jump is a customer acquisition platform. And the name of our customer acquisition platform is Traffic Cloud. And the short story is we show you exactly how to outmaneuver the competition to double your marketing performance. And so the, the first really two entrees into that is number one, display. We understand where a company should run their display versus just the who, which is how display is done today. And that's extremely complicated to figure out. But every time we do this for our customers, we see double, triple, and, and have even seen some quadruple um, uh, increases in performance. Wow. And what, second, what specifically is leading to that doubling or tripling? What, what, what specifically? So where to run your display. Got it. So if you, a quick physical analogy would be, if you were selling convertible cars, you would probably not put up a billboard in Alaska. Right. In the physical world. Yep. But You'd be yet, wasting market, your money, which obviously reduces your ROI. Exactly right. But yet marketers do that every single day online over and over and over again. Got it. Got it. Fascinating. And then, and then this is a, a relatively new innovation. What's been the biggest challenge from a sales perspective to get heads of marketing to try this? Because obviously it sounds like a no brainer. It sounds like, you know, mom and pop and apple pie. Yep, absolutely. So um, the, the, the brutal, honest answer is the way the market is set up. It's a seller's market. It is not set up for a buyer's market, which is the customer, right? The deck is stacked against the buy side of the market. And there's, we see a lot of pushback um, with people who have a, a vested interest um, in the way they run display. They make a ton of money off of it yep. on the sell side of the market. And um, they, 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 they do not like uh, someone like us coming in that, that this literally could lead to the reallocation of how billions of dollars are spent. Right. They, they prefer to obfuscate uh, the data and, and the results. 
yeah, they don't, they do not like transparency and we love transparency. Got it. Fantastic. So I mentioned earlier, you're based in Indianapolis. You've got a team of what, roughly 40 people or so? Yep. Just shy. Just shy of 40. Yes. And you just raised a, a series A round. I don't know if you're able to talk about that round or how much it was. Yeah, absolutely. In, uh, so in March, we closed a $6 million round and um, brought on some great um, Midwest and coastal VCs that we're, we're super excited about. So flyover capital, uh, cultivation capital, um, and the uh, Rise of the Rest Fund um, were, were three of the uh, larger investors that came in and were a part of that $6 million great. round. Fantastic firms, obviously. So let, now let's shift to the people part, which is why people are listening. So how did you learn how to hire people? Somewhere along the line, you must have learned or figured it out through, you know, trial and error. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is my eighth or ninth company, and I've made lots of mistakes um, over the years, and I, I continue to make mistakes. I try to get better <laughs> at the mistakes I make. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think a couple, a couple of core things. Uh, number one is, is hire slow and fire fast. Uh, number two would be if you can get your first three or four hires out of the gate that are, that are truly A players, A hires, mm -hmm. um, every single A player will attract another one, two, or three A players. Uh, and then all and, of a and inversely, I would assume if you get those first few wrong, you're really screwed. You're really screwed. Yes, yep. that's right. Um, and so that's, that's really what we – what we try to focus on, I guess the third bucket would be then does that somebody can be an A player, but not really buy into what you're doing a hundred percent, you know, mm -hmm. hook, line and sinker. Mm -hmm. And so I think that third bucket is that, that they, they agree in a line and see the vision, uh, you know, of what you're trying to do as a company, um, right. In our, in our case, challenging that status quo. Got it. So you mentioned, uh, something pretty interesting, which was higher, slow, higher, slow, fire, fast, pretty, common expression. Let's talk about what that means. So let's, let's talk about the higher slow part and then we'll talk fire fast. What does higher slow mean specifically? How do you operationalize that? Obviously it means you take your time. You, does that mean you see a certain number of candidates or you put each candidate through a certain number of interviews or how do you do that? So I'll, I'll use a, a recent case study uh, example um, with the man jump. So our head of engineering uh, does a great job of, you know, out there recruiting and, and, and bringing in the different types of engineers that we need to have on the team. And, you know, we needed to double the size of our engineering team. And there were um, multiple candidates that came through that were really, they were great people, um, but they didn't quite have the right skill set or the right demeanor, you know, whether it's a cultural fit or skill set. They, they, they were good, but not quite right. Mm -hmm. And having having the discipline to not go ahead and bring them on board and, and waiting for those, you know, that kind of quote unquote, I, I don't know if perfect is the right word, but, but really waiting on those people who are, who are well aligned from not only a skill set standpoint, but from a culture standpoint yep. uh, has, has led us to where we are today. Our, our engineering team, I couldn't be more proud of. And it took us probably an extra nine months of, of hiring process um, to, to get the engineers that we have today. But as we turn around now, I think we've gotten two or three X farther by, by, you know, in the same time period, by taking that extra time to really so, try to get. Them. So it's, it's not settling. It's waiting for the perfect pitch, just like yep. Warren Buffett does in investing, right? He'll wait and wait and wait and wait so that when the right one comes, he knows what it looks like. Yes. And it's really painful and we're not always perfect, but, uh, I think we do a fairly decent job of it, and it's really painful, but uh, when we turn around, we're, we're happy. What is that pain? Describe that to listeners. Um, the, the pain is that, you know, in, in this context, the platform, you know, the productization of the discoveries we make um, don't get productized into the platform as quickly as we want them to. Just because you exactly. literally have fewer resources available versus plan. That's right. That's exactly right. Got it. So you will go to your board now, <laughs> your investors, and you will say, look, we are not going to ship X or hit Y target or revenue because we're not going to settle for B players. What, how do you explain that in a way that you know, a, a, someone who's not involved on a day-to-day -day basis will understand? 
I, just I think the I, I think it comes down to the the simple phrase I learned the first year out of college, and that was managed by fact. And and so you know if we manage by fact and we're eyes wide open and and know that we're making decisions in a purposeful way, um, then then we can deal with you know the ebbs and flows of of moving forward in a in a in a very purposeful way. Got it. Right. Let's talk about uh, the fire fast part. And then I want to talk a little about that hiring process. So what does fire fast look like? What does it mean? How long do you give people? And how long do you typically, does it typically take for you to know you've made a, a bad hire? I think it, it depends on the position, but I think typically, you know, um, sometimes, you know, in the first 90 days, but I think probably more on average is it, it, it's probably closer to to four months plus or minus, mm -hmm. right? From a sales standpoint, I think it's, you know, six months plus. Just because um, of the sales cycle? Yeah, just because of the, you know, depending on the ramp up time with, you know, the complexity of, of whatever you might be selling. Um, you know, if it's more enterprise level, more of a complex sell, it's, it's a little hard to tell, you know, inside of six months. You're probably looking at, at nine months. Um, you know, with, uh, with other types of, positions, customer success or engineering, et cetera. I think you definitely know, you know, between three months and six months. Got it. Do you ever know in a day or a week or a couple of weeks that the, the culture fit, the DNA match just is not there or does it literally take you that long to establish that? I've had one or two equations uh, or one or two occasions where um, in one, there's one specifically in a previous business that's sticking out in my head that I literally knew the very first day. I, I knew in the first 15 tell, minutes. Tell, tell us a little about that. What happened? Um, it was a completely different type of business, um, but it was a, um, a, a business that, that sells experiences for the general population, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And we hired someone to run that business for us when yep. we bought it. And um, a great person, great, great human being. Um, but the first day when we showed up, and he was taking over. Um, I, I could just tell by the way he what he his what he wanted to do. His first interactions with not only customers or employees, um, but the first things going through his mind were directly opposite of what should be going through his mind. I literally knew in 15 minutes, and I pulled my partner aside um, about 15 minutes later, and about an hour later, we um, pulled the gentleman aside and said, "You know what? This is not going to work." Right. And Luckily, we knew the, the uh, company he had worked with before, and we protected his job to go back to work at that company. Uh, and literally, it was um, from start time to, uh, you know, what this isn't going to work was all done inside of two hours. Wow. Amazing. What could you have done in hindsight to identify that that was going to be an issue? Because clearly, it was a mismatch, right? It wasn't a, a training issue or anything else. It just never should have happened. How did he get through, and what could – is there anything you could have done? Uh, to, to realize it. Yeah, absolutely. So in this situation, it was someone um, who did, uh, you know, B2B sales. Mm -hmm. They were going to walk in and try to run a business that was somewhat akin to running a restaurant. Got and, it. And, and so those skill sets just don't, um, they just don't align, right? They're just different. And so, so do you think you missed it, not you, but your team missed it in the interviews or reference checks or again, what could have stemmed that from happening? I think we, um, I, I think both of us, right, the, the, the employee and us, I think we both, um, it, I don't know if the, the word ignored is correct, but we, but we neglected to ask ourselves the basic question of, this person's awesome at this job. Will those skills translate to a very different type of job? I see. Got it. Yep. Or just ignored the signs and looked the other way. Yep. Let's shift gears to a much, much happier note. Let's talk about a recruiting success you've had in the past 12 months. Maybe it's a rock star hire that you made or something. You don't need to name names. But what worked flawlessly in that process that people that, that are listening could replicate? Yep. So um, one thing we love to do is give homework. And what, and do you so, mean, what do you mean by that? So if it's a salesperson, um, how would you sell demand jump 
with what you know. If it's an engineer, we may give them a set of problems and say, come back and, and tell us uh, what you would do with this data set or how you would, um, how you would pr productize a feature, right? Like we give them a, uh, get, kind of give them a mini problem and see how they respond. Uh, and I say problem, I don't mean it in a bad way, like a, a pro like a project. Yeah, like a project. And, and nothing that's going to take days to respond to, but something super simple um, that you'd be surprised at how many people never ever, you never hear from again. Uh, so tell, you've literally seen people take the assignment, go away, and never come back. Absolutely. And what did you assume from that? That they're not an A player, they're not a self starter. Um, that they're not a good culture fit. What would you say to what would you say to the the person that would say, well, they're just too busy, and you can't you can't ask people to do homework, especially for free. Um, that's a person that's not a good fit at demand jump. Then, I mean, yeah. so you know, these are these are these are projects that that would take them, um, I don't know, maybe four to eight hours max um, to to work on and put together. And if they won't invest that amount of time in their future they're certainly not going to invest any time for our customers. Right. That's probably the best you're ever going to see them. Yep. So what are you looking for in the results of that homework or assignment, whatever you call it? I call it a test drive. Different people call it different things. What are you looking for? You're not looking for a specific answer, are you? That's exactly right. We're not looking for a specific answer. We're looking to understand how they think. Right, so how they deliver that in, in free uh, sales position versus engineering, you know, versus a customer success. These are all very different types of roles. So it isn't necessarily a right answer. It just helps us understand how they think and how much pride they take in what they do. Got it. Right. How how, how gussied up is whatever they're delivering back to us? Can you give an example? Again, you don't have to name names, but of a a person that comes to mind in a, what kind of role? What was the assignment and what was it about their delivery of that assignment or homework that knocked your socks off and made you say, this is our person? Um, so in sales, we had someone that um, came in and delivered their approach on a sales pitch um, that, that was 90% on point. So, so you know, we constantly are challenging ourselves to make our messaging simpler because what we do is, is complex, but yep. the, the, the output is very simple, right? Yep. Double your market performance, right? But but how we do that, it gets kind of complicated. And they had a very elegant, um, you know, elegant way that uh, that they delivered the pitch to us. That actually is influencing uh, adjustments we're making now. In, so in how with no it. training, no onboarding, and nothing more than what they had gathered, I guess, online or during the interview process, they actually taught you a thing or two. That's correct. How often does that happen? What percentage of the time when you give people homework, do you say, why the hell didn't we think of that? <laughs> um, probably, gosh, I'd probably say 20, 25%, you know, maybe, maybe roughly a fourth of the time you'll get some interesting anecdote that got, you think, oh, wow, that's interesting. Or yeah. makes you even think of something else that you haven't thought of, right? Yeah. Yep. Great. Amazing. So you would not skip that step. That, that homework step? Well, I say no, but in, in, if I'm being truthful, um, sometimes we do. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, we, you, 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 sometimes we fail to hold true to that, but most of the time we give a homework assignment. Got it. Regardless of role? Yes. Got it. So what, let's shift from recruiting to retention. What, what do you lose sleep over when it comes to retention? You've got just about 40 people on board obviously a very hot job market. Some of them get phone calls from other opportunities. What do you do, if anything, to keep them from considering other opportunities? We try to do several things. Um, number one is uh, we run the company off of one piece of paper. It's a one pager. And that one pager includes in the top left-hand corner, our BHAG, right? Our North Star, where we're marching towards yep. in the next five years. And all the way down to the lower uh, right-hand corner involves each department, what the goals are this quarter that, that ultimately get to this year's goals, the next five-year goals, you know, by year, and then ultimately the BHAG. So we want people to be, to be very involved and understand exactly where we're headed, what the numbers look like, um, right, good and bad, right? Uh, so that's, that's number one. Um, number two, everybody that comes on board here reads the book called Essentialism. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the whole goal of getting, you know, get rid of the clutter, get rid of the noise. Yep. And really on that, that one thing that's important. 
Um, number three is we uh, believe that a family that eats together stays together. So every Friday we have what we call Freaky Friday. Yeah. That, <laughs> runs, that, that runs between noon and two. And we all eat together. And, and we for, talk for to lunch them. or dinner or what? For lunch. Yep. We all have lunch together every, every, the entire company every Friday. And we will always maintain that. And as we start to get remote people, we're setting up video cameras to you know, live stream that, right? So we're all together. Um, and so in, in we, that's, we do big announcements. Sometimes we don't do business at all. Sometimes we have guest speakers come in and, yep. and share their stories. So it's really, a, it's a lot of fun. So you and make it just, personal and you think that drives retention or helps drive absolutely. retention. Absolutely. I think we, we need to be involved in, 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 I mean, this kind of a high level. We need to, we need to be empathetic with each other on, in, from a personal life, you know, all the way to the professional life. And then the, the last thing we've done is launched a, a committee. There's two of our uh, uh, team members. They have launched a committee called Demand Fun. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we'll, we have all types of outings, right? Um, and we're getting ready to start you know, doing uh, nonprofit activities as well. So we're really excited about that. Got it. Before we wrap up, you, you, we mentioned uh, earlier that you just closed this very sizable Series A funding from some great investors how you know a lot of times companies intend to upgrade or expand their team when they raise capital is that the case for your business how important is that for your hiring process and and what involvement would the investors have in recruiting yep so um our investors definitely have a role in recruiting uh, so in fact we we just brought on um, our cro uh, 60 90 days ago which i'm super super excited about um, and, you know, he led North American sales for a, another large um, B2B, B2B software company called Exact Target that exited the sales force. Uh, so, so Joe, our new CRO, has been in, in this role in, in several other companies. And so um, I actually uh, was introduced to him by one of our lead investors. No um, kidding. So, yeah. So very excited about that. And, and we're building for the first time, you know, a, a full scale uh, sales and marketing team, which is really exciting. If you had to guess this time next year, roughly how many people do you think you'd be up to? My guess this time next year, um, we would be, um, we're a little bit under 40 now. So I think we'd be at 50 ish. Great. Maybe like 50. Great. Well, we'd love to have you back on the show at that time. I congratulate you, Christopher, for putting together something very cool that really helps companies target their marketing. How can people learn more about Demand Jump and get involved? Uh, go check out our website at uh, demandjump.com and um, give us a call and, and or shoot us an email and we would love to uh, see how we can add value. Fantastic. Thank you so much for making the time. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Talk to you soon.